Oh, hi. Sorry about that. I was staring off into space. But now that you're here, I want to show you this thing. This is a home portrait Graflex. It's kind of like the other Graflex SLRs I've shown in videos before, but it has some key differences. And if you wonder what those differences are, you're in the right place because I'm about to spend like 20 minutes talking about it. Admittedly, it's been a while, so just a quick refresher, right? Graflex SLRs are these big, cool cameras made a long time ago. They take large format film, which is a lot larger than most other films you might see, and that means you're gonna get like a higher resolution picture and the grain's gonna be less prominent. And generally, depth of field in large format photography is going to be thinner, which makes it good for like portraiture and stuff, because you get really blurry backgrounds. Most large format photography is done on something like a view camera where you have this big bellows and you're looking into a ground glass where the image is inverted and reversed. So it's pretty difficult to compose a shot, but that's where these guys come in. It's an SLR so you can preview the picture you're about to take before you take it. So you could definitely go around and do this handheld. So it's a really cool little thing and I really enjoy using them. Most large format cameras like this one are gonna take four by five inch film, which is like 16 times 35 millimeters. So a lot of detail and stuff. But this guy takes five by seven inch film, which is even larger. Typically, if you're gonna shoot larger than four by five, you'd probably go to eight by 10, which is kind of like the next step up. Five by seven is this weird in-between format that isn't very common. But I think five by seven is basically as large as you can go while still being able to handhold the camera. You know what, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if this qualifies as handholdable. I think that was a little bit of a stretch. But most importantly, it has a rotating back. Now that is super cool. In my anecdotal experience, if I say Graflex SLR, even the nerdiest camera nerds only have a vague idea of what I'm talking about. But if I say an RB Graflex, th they know what I mean immediately. But despite this, not all Graflex SLRs have a rotating back. This one, for example, is landscape only all the time. Having a rotating back is really cool, but it's not really the end all be all. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal if you have to take something in landscape, but in some situations, it's extremely useful. There's a couple Graflex models that shoot five by seven inch film, but this is the only one mass produced at least that also has a rotating back. I think it's pretty easy to see why. This thing has to be massive to support five by seven inches, both horizontally and vertically. It's a chonkster for sure. So when I heard about this camera, I was absolutely enamored with the idea of it. I mean, it sounds really cool, and it is. The only issue is that it costs two arms, three legs, and sometimes an organ, depending on where you buy one from. In many ways, this was a dream camera, kind of something that isn't particularly practical, but I really hope to, to get one day. But with more people getting into film photography and camera price is going up, every time one of these pops up online, the price goes up by several hundred dollars. And my fear was, it's, it's already something I can't really afford, or I, I can't afford, I can't afford, but if I don't do it now, I'm, I might never have the opportunity to. 10 years from now, if film is still around, it's possible these things could be twice as much as they are now, it would be an impossibility for anyone who doesn't shoot with this kind of thing professionally to afford one. I decided, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it right. I, so, I, so I went a searching. Little did I know it would take over a year. I set up a bunch of email alerts just to notify me when somebody's selling one of these cameras on eBay, Etsy. I still did a lot of manual searching. It seems that a lot of cameras like these, given their age, get listed online by people who don't necessarily use them, but somehow came to own one, like inheriting it or something. This one, for example, doesn't have home portrait written on it anywhere. So I got in the habit of every week going online and just looking through all these saved searches just to see if something slipped through. But eventually I got an email and this one was actually through Facebook. Um, somebody in a Facebook group had made a post about wanting to sell their home portrait and I was the first one to comment on it. It was total luck too because if I was there like 15 minutes later somebody else would have gotten it for sure. Let's just fast forward to the fun part. I get it in the mail. Oh my god, so exciting. The packing's immaculate. Wow, it's beautiful. Of course to a normal person it just looks like an empty box but it's, it's not just a box. It's my box. Jesus Christ. I got it out to test it, very excited, and immediately it's not working. So I go here 
and it just it doesn't lock in. As you can imagine, a lot of mixed feelings, a lot of frustration, wondering why I did this to myself. Shooting film in general is, it, it can be a lot of fun, but there's a lot of frustrating parts about it. And I think that's kind of what makes it rewarding, right? The issue is a really weird one though. It's that only one shutter speed was functioning. Nothing ever goes as planned, does it? We got the camera open here, which is, you know, generally something you never want to see. If the shutter's open right now, great, looks nice, but it won't let me go past the open mode. It won't let me go to any other aperture. And I took the back off, assuming that it must be an issue with, see this little like metal thing? Occasionally those can get bent and get the shutter stuck when it's like uh, going around the roller. Doesn't look like that's the problem. I'm wearing a headlamp um, so I can better see the screws and stuff. And I gotta say, I think I should just like attach a headlamp to my head permanently. I look like one of those uh, deep sea creatures. It is definitely very like middle-aged dad though. In the past, I've been able to open up Graflexes and figure out problems because typically it's not necessarily easy, but it's it's often a lot more achievable compared to like smaller cameras with all these intricate parts. And the issue I typically come across is that the gears are a hundred years old and they just need to be cleaned off because they're covered in dust, which is, you know, that I can handle. Another wrinkle is that it was working when it got put into the mail and the box was in great condition. So whatever happened occurred during shipping, but didn't leave like a visible mark on the box, perhaps an x-ray attack or the use of sonic waves. I talked to the previous owner and like the two people I know who work on Graflex SLRs and there was not a consensus at all. This issue is very weird and very strange, very nebulous. And the prospect of having to send this massive camera cross country, months of waiting, not to mention the cost. I mean, I already buried my credit card. I held a funeral for it. It would be pretty embarrassing to like, you know, show up at the graveyard with this shovel in the middle of the night being like, uh, sorry, I, I did not done with you yet. I needed to take this big plate off the camera. The problem is that it's connected directly to the mirror in order for you to reset the mirror after each shot. So in order to take this plate off, you have to punch this pin out of the little mirror lever. This thing wasn't going anywhere. Literally me standing here with a hammer trying to knock this pin out. I had to remove the entire mirror rod by disconnecting it from the inside here. The mystery deepens. It is something with the shutter mechanism. Excuse the grease. It will go over to T8. Problem solved? No. When I put it up to the camera body, attempt to, to go to T8, it still locks. Once I got the plate off, it looked fine. I didn't see anything wrong with it. I did not know what the issue was, but in the process of looking at it and troubleshooting it, I kind of heard one of the rollers make a like a clicking noise and suddenly it worked. It's probably an issue that's gonna have to be sorted out one way or another eventually, but at least for now I've solved it. So I'm gonna demonstrate this with um, one of the smaller cameras. The mirror has a spring attached to it in order to fly up when you take a picture. And springs need to be tightened over time in order to make sure the tension's correct. And on a lot of Graflexes, there's this cool little um, metal thing on the side here that allows you to tighten the spring without even having to open up the camera. This is a great solution. The home portrait doesn't have that for some reason. I'm sure some do, but mine doesn't. What that means is that inside of here, there's a spring just screwed into the side of the, the camera. And that spring needs to be under tension as you're attaching the spring to the mirror. It's a lot of pressure. So you need like several arms in order to do this. And it was a nightmare. It was terrible. I was later told in no uncertain terms that I shouldn't have removed that mirror arm at all because it puts a lot of stress on the mirror arm messes with it. So I don't know. I accepted the risks. If this is like my forever camera, camera that I have for a lifetime, you know, I'm going to find somebody, anybody who can figure out some way to add an external spring tightening mechanism on this thing. Cause that was such a nightmare. I never want to do it ever again. Finally, after years of waiting and weeks of messing around, I am able to use this camera and boy, oh boy, is it a pain to use? It's so, it's so difficult. Well, why don't I give you the tour? So this is how you focus. You know, you have the bellows come in and out. This right here is the rising and falling mechanism. 
This is the curtain aperture plate. So this one is the one inch opening, two inch opening. This is kind of weird. This one's called T8. So for this, basically you switch the, this knob here over to the say S, you switch it over to S. When you fire the shutter, it will actually go through multiple different curtain speeds without stopping. And this is for longer exposures. This camera can go all the way up to one one thousandth of a second, while this one only goes up to one five hundredth. And the trade-off is that you get some slower shutter speeds as well. And then this button here is how we can rotate the back. There you go. Here's the hood. You can see I have this weird sticky note in here. This is my timetable. Most cameras have them on the body, but mine does not. I want to make my own and like attach it somewhere so I don't have to carry around a post-it note with me, but whatever. How's it going? So I'm in the gardening section of Walmart. Um, I lugged this big plastic case out here to try to take pictures of stuff because I'm too scared to carry this camera around without like six inches of protective material surrounding it. I'm incredibly hot and would like to get done with this as soon as I can. So let's, let's go for it. Why don't we? Ooh. I got the recommendation to use a um, guitar strap quick release system with this thing and it works great. It's more of just like a way to stabilize the camera while you're taking a picture. Don't drop this camera, okay? So this is kind of fun. I found a pair of glasses over here and I think what I'm gonna do is try to take a picture of it. It's gonna be macro basically. I'm gonna meter for like f8 probably. Check my little chart. Let's go three at one fourth. Um, and it looks like a dragonfly's right there, so I may be able to get a picture of him too. Ah, oh, he's back. Hey, I think I might have gotten it. I'm not sure. Uh, good attempt at the very least. The blur looks really cool, um, but there's some pretty obvious problems with it. For starters, the little bug is definitely blurry. This is motion blur from the camera. The camera wasn't steady enough when the picture was being taken, so that's what that's about. The other thing that's really strange is this up here. I'm not sure if you see this, these square patterns going on here. For developing 5x7, I use the taco method. I put them in this little plastic mesh and then just put them in a normal Patterson tank. And I think I must have inserted it with the emulsion side out instead of in, so it cause this to form on the film. I want to take a picture of like over there. It looks kind of nice, like like right here. I was going to do a picture over here, but I was trying to frame it and it just didn't look good. So I decided to do something else. And while I was over there, I saw something crazy. Do you see that right there? There's some sunglasses and a bone. That's so sick. That would be such a cool picture. It's way too dark to get handheld, at least with the lenses I brought. So just gonna have to, to pass on it, which is too bad. But what I got instead, a picture of this cool rock that a bunch of damselflies are hanging out on. A little boring, but uh, kind of cool. We'll, we'll see how it turns out. This is at F9. And look at, look at like how shallow the depth of field is. Unfortunately, it looks like there's more motion blur. I have to remember to shoot at higher shutter speeds, but otherwise, I mean, it's kind of a neat picture. Was it worth coming out here? Absolutely not. This thing's so heavy. I know a lot of people assume that if you buy an expensive camera, your pictures are gonna be better just from the cost of admission alone. But this is one of those things where the more expensive you go, the more difficult and more of a pain it is to, to use. There was a huge learning curve for me, and that's coming from shooting mainly on other Graflex SLRs. Going through the effort to load film, carry the camera somewhere, take the picture, reinsert the dark slide, develop it, only to see that it's like blurry is the worst feeling ever. But that's what makes the good pictures so much more rewarding. Despite talking about Graflexes several times, I tend to not show the viewfinders on them. And it's not for a lack of trying. It's just really hard to show a ground glass on video. But this is what you're dealing with when you're trying to focus on something. And unlike a lot of other more modern cameras, this doesn't have a focusing aid. That cat moved and now it's, it's tastefully out of focus, but I kind of like it. It looks like he's glowing. In large format, you tend to use a little magnifying glass in order to look at the ground glass and make sure you're in focus, but that's not applicable here. There's a couple solutions that people have come up with. All of them I've tried, I haven't been super 
happy with. I'm looking into that. I'm trying to figure out a good way to do it, but I don't, I don't have a solution. Another thing about this camera that's really annoying, the ground glass, all right? On an SLR camera, the ground glass needs to be the same distance from the lens as the film is from the lens in order to preview focus correctly. And on other graph flexes, you can kind of adjust it if you need to by putting shims on the wood that the glass sits on. But on the home portrait, the ground glass is suspended above the mirror with these little clips, these very flimsy metal little clips. And I don't like it at all. It's kind of difficult to see, but the clip is this thing right here. And that's the only thing supporting the ground glass. You have to like put shims on the underside of this clip to slightly elevate the ground glass. It's, I, I, can't, I cannot wrap my head around it. But once you get everything out of the way, you can get some really nice pictures. With five by seven inch film, you can get hundreds of megapixels, if not more even with cheap films, if you were to use something like slide film, I can't even imagine the kind of results you could get with that kind of setup. The limiting factor would probably be the lens you use though, because you would need something really sharp in order to get the small details, you know? So with all that said, should you get one of these yourself? Of course not, are you insane? I'm one of the biggest fans of the Graflex cameras that I know, all right? And even I have a hard time justifying this thing. It's huge. It's expensive. You pay thousands of dollars and you still have to pay money for each picture you take. Imagine explaining that to somebody who, who's never shot with film. It's, it's a crazy idea in a digital world, you know? I think you can make the argument that like any digital camera that could rival the quality of this one is gonna be factors more expensive. But that's only under the best conditions, right? Film is really noisy. It's not as sensitive to light as digital sensors. The lenses are, are not very new, so you're not getting this, the optical quality of like modern glass. And being able to use different film stocks is kind of lost on a camera like this because five by seven is a pretty unique format. You can get five by seven color film from Kodak. They still make it. You can get some on B&H right now. It's just a pack of 50 shots is about $400 and you need to order 20 boxes. 60 boxes, it's even worse than I imagined. Oh my God. Obviously nobody does that. Every year, a bunch of people get together and do a custom order with Kodak. So everybody pools their money to get to like the minimum amount. I would love to shoot on it someday. I can't imagine the fidelity under ideal circumstances you could get with like slide film or even just like Portra and five by seven inches. It, 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 50 shots of color sheet film would last forever. It takes so much effort to take a single shot. Like that's, that would probably last me personally years. But the elephant in the room is $400. That's insane. That's crazy. That's a cost that's probably only gonna get worse. That's kind of a bummer. Another thing I wanna address is the whole like YouTuber price meme. And it's true where somebody makes a YouTube video about some cool camera and then the price like skyrockets. I don't want this video to be that. I really don't think I have enough reach in order to make an effect like that. And also these go for sale so infrequently. To be honest with you, I would be happier if the value of these cameras went down. And I know, I know if you own one, you, you might not want that to happen, but um, I just think that it's a camera that's meant to be used. And when it's so expensive, it's really difficult to justify taking out. Something I'm a little curious about is, I'm, I'm really hoping that a really skilled craftsperson is able to make new versions of SLR large format cameras, because I don't know how expensive it would be to produce one. The value of the home portrait in particular is starting to get to a point where like, you probably could make a new one for a similar cost. I mean, I, I don't know how much similar, but I haven't run the numbers or anything, but I feel like it would be possible. Who knows? I think that's basically it. If you enjoyed this video, you should stick around. And thanks for watching. May. Real quick, before this video ends, Jeff Perry from 20th Century Camera is having a really tough time right now. Oh my gosh. So I'm going to put a link to his Instagram in the description. If you're a Graflex enthusiast, you should go show some support. Okay, bye.